Ta-ta. For any of you who are absolutely curious, these are the places I asked Paula, who's ever so industrious, why not speak at Lyon County about my new book, Buffalo Man, and why don't you get, would you get me to a few places? Three months later, I had 14 places. Some of the towns, I'm not sure they were there anymore, but the libraries were. So I gave a talk, and some of the crowds were up at 30. And the last one I did, I must confess, was up to four, but then one guy seemed to get called out for a deal on cattle, and he never came back, so <laughs> it was three. If any of you are interested in the places, or to see the main drawing that then we recomposed for the title of the book. That's from Abby Rohr. Abby Rohr was my artist in a book, Dust Book, A History of the Small and the Invisible. And I just wanted her to draw it because she can draw really well. And then in consultation with me, she helped make the cover. A few things to start. I was telling, you want to pass it around? You don't need to, but there's the places. I brought this in, and I was telling people before you all came in, more than any of you knew, I was a river rat. I loved rivers. I, I knew how to canoe very early, and I canoed often alone. The Clinton River in Michigan was my trial area, but we had islands and other places. Well, I had a bypass 30 years ago, and I wanted to prove to my wife I was still alive, and I wanted to prove to the world I could still move. So I went canoeing with Dave Nass, if any of you remember Dave. And Dave had a partner, Don Suchak from Mankato, and I was supposed to have the fourth guy on the trip. He never showed up. I commanded a canoe for 130 miles on the Missouri River, although it was downstream, it was windy as hell. One day, everybody but the little kayak people who go under the wind blowing off the water, and it was really quite wonderful. But as I said, talking to mountain sheep and cattle, I didn't know either language. But you leave me out there along, I was singing some Italian operas to the <laughs> animals out there. But I came on to a beaver's nest on the right-hand side of the Missouri River, and I saw all these cuttings that looked just about the right side for a walking stick. Went through muck. I thought I was going to sink in the muck. Some people think I did. And... Uh, Pulled this one off, it was my favorite. Had the bend, all that's beaver cut. So that's my walking stick, all right? I wouldn't trade you. <laughs> then when I was gonna give the talk on Buffalo Man, I asked my daughter, who just got a nice, prestigious art job, which means she lives in a city she can't afford. <laughs> that, these academic jobs aren't all they're knocked up to be. But anyhow, I wanted her to do a buffalo mask, so intermittently in the talk, I could pull this thing on a stick and go like this, but he didn't. So what she did is she <laughs> sent me this. And the advantage of this cap is I'm going begging out here, and I'm going to get more, no apples or pennies. I'm going after the quarters and the big baby roots. You like my hat? Anyhow, I scared three buffalo off the cliff in Laverne, you know where that high part goes. They saw me and they said, that's an odd buffalo if I've ever seen one. <laughs> the, uh, a moment of seriousness, and then I'll probably get what you might call filled with stories and humorous, hopefully humorous. 
But a serious note is, and maybe it's, I had my 80th birthday. Maybe that's like when a pond changes. <laughs> and I'm hoping it goes from dark green over to pure white, but it might be going from pure white to totally dark green. Anyhow, I had that birthday, and my mind really has dwelled on how much we belong to our past. I belong to the past of my families. And then I belong to the past of places. And this place, 40 years, has really been a long time here. And keep in mind, that's a biblical number, 40 years. Who was on the desert 40 years? Who was looking for a promised land for 40 years? 40 is such a big biblical number, so two times 40 is twice 40, 80. So I really got filled with, I am the composite of places I've been, and the composite of people, most of whom treated me well, some even loved me, so I'm a composite of gratitude. And I'm a composite of time. By a composite of time, I'm still in the fields in World War II, rushing out in the field. And we had to say, before we hit the field area where we played guns, we didn't play guns, though. What do you think we played? War. And the big, strong kid on the block would run out and say, I'm the American. The next strong guy would say, I'm the Canadian. Some, one or two, we had some heavy Germans in the Detroit neighborhood. A few would even say, okay, I'll be the German. No one wanted to be the Japanese. And I was almost small enough to get forced to play the role of the Japanese in the trenches of east side Detroit. So I'd always get out there and say, I'm the Russian. I like the idea of Russians because they thought they snuck around. So while the others were killing each other, I could sneak around. Anyhow, silly stuff like that, but time decorates and deepens your soul. So you got time, time making your soul, place making your soul, family making your soul, communities making your soul. And we really have a soul that is a multiplicity of experiences. How's that sound? Does that make some sense? Now, here's the big one. We don't really know ourselves because we're deeper than we are. Our minds and spirits are actually deeper than our consciousness of our minds and spirits. I studied Freud, and I thought he was Listen to this, I thought he was superficial. That means on the top of things, on the top surface. I really kind of came to the conclusion, we are our history, and now I've shifted, we are our archeology. span We are the times and places that are so deep in us, we maybe don't even consciously remember them. But guess what? When you get older, what starts to be reborn in your mind? A little memory here, a sentence there, a thing there. So that's, that makes us sound serious, this talk. I had to do that. And I had to tie it to history. And let me try one other thing that'll make it kind of legitimate as a talk. My grandfather was a great storyteller. He was German, and his mother was an O'Brien, so he was a West Prussian Irish man. And this was before television. He wasn't a big radio listener. And not, unlike my father, he didn't give much a damn what happened to the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> he was from Mill Country in Wisconsin, Nina Menasha. Fox River Valley, but he loves stories. So he would teach me, I'm only six years old, and my head is getting filled 
with how do I know Aunt Sade is at home? My grandmother had an older sister, Sadie. And Sadie was so reclusive, she liked to trick people into thinking she wasn't at home. My grandfather set me wise to Aunt Sadie, who of course was long dead, but it was still important I knew this according to him. Just go out and check the fresh, how fresh the footprints are to the outhouse. And we'll know if Aunt Sadie's alive or not. So that's the kind of stuff I heard. He also told me why the church, I'm only six or seven, you gotta have a little, this is the kind of stuff they fill this container up with. I mean, I didn't have, when adults speak, I didn't have like a filter. It went in this ear and God helped me out of good memory. So I also knew, among other things, why the church in Menasha, Wisconsin, Catholic Church, well, it was actually the Catholic, I don't know sure if it was the German or the Irish Church, but there was also a Polish Church. All those churches in Wisconsin have three, three churches. I have some people who might agree. There's the Polish Church, that's usually St. John's. Then there's one called O'Danny Boy, St. O'Danny Boy, that's the Irish Church, and that's a joke, St. Patrick. And the third church, St. Mary's, and that's in the big wood and red brick. Well, I don't know which church this priest worked at, but my grandfather told me this former priest, well, first off, the church lights would go on at midnight every night. And he said to me, seven years old or six, why did the church lights go on at that time of night? He said, well, that money bulging priest was taking all these money to say masses for the dead. That's very Catholic. You take, you gather money and then you're hoping you not only light candles, but you get really serious to have a whole mass or many set for a dead soul. It helps them in their ascent to the afterlife. It's very old and very Christian. That's why the earliest Christian churches were built on top of the dead, the holy dead. So if you, want, if you only had a broken ankle, your holy church where you go for a pilgrimage would only be from here to Ghent. If you're blind, you might have to walk up to St. Paul. But anyhow, this guy would take any money for any wish you had, particularly for the dead. His pockets grew like that with money. But he never said the masses. He just took the money. As a result, God, or St. Peter, wasn't going to let him get off the face of this earth till he completed those masses. That's why the church lights went on at seven years, it's at midnight every, every night. Now, I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm not even asking you to take that seriously. I'm just telling you, we human beings, a lot of stuff comes in our head. And like it or not, we become a lot of the stuff that filters from the world in. So I was a river rat. I had a storytelling grandfather. And then, as you'll hear, I had five grandchildren of my own. And after my wife got sick of taking care of, she never got sick of it, but she was endless goodwill. But after she did all this stuff, I'd often get to tell bedtime stories. The core of Buffalo Man comes out of those bedtime stories and the Cottonwood Lounge. And I don't know exactly, but it might have been in the Cottonwood Lounge where I thought I ought to mer merge a person to an animal of an unusual size. Now that's not altogether unusual. Some people mer merge dragons and people. If you read old mythic books, there's eagles and people, eagle, human, lion, human. Anybody else know other mixtures of human? Yeah? In Greek mythology, almost every single god has an uh, animal. Most of them are birds. 
birds often, yeah. But there's a famous one that'll even come up in my book, which was the horseman. Do you know who he was in Greek mythology? His name? He was called Senator. And what is nice and important to know, he was the friendly horseman. Usually you got a horse and a man together, you got a nasty animal. So you get the way this is going. And then a thing people don't know, and then I'm going to start getting into the book. I'm glad you talked. That's wonderful. I, I, I want you to participate. Uh, when I studied history, went for my master's degree, I got it in French Canada. All my courses were in French. And I went up there to be an historian because the draft board said you got to work for a higher degree and we'll dra or we'll draft you. And I didn't like the way that war was going very well. I didn't like the idea of jungles and shooting and I, I didn't see a lot of sense to that. So I thought better get I wanted to go to uh, Paris to study theology. French, French Catholic theology. So the best I could do is history in Quebec. It was a lovely place. I was in old Quebec City. I know it like the back of my hand. I walked it in the winter. It's one of the oldest cities in North America. It's all tied up to the Buffalo Man book. The adoptive parents of Buffalo Man are from Quebec. Their last name of the father, adoptive, was Joseph Bisson. And Bisson is a French word for bison. So it's fitting he should adopt the buffalo man. But one third or one fourth of my courses were one year in French folklore. So I ended up knowing about French Canadian folklore. I know more about werewolves than I bet you anyone here. I damn near after I was up there a while got to believe that my brother-in-law was a driver of a 4053 Chevy was a werewolf once in a while. <laughs> well, I exaggerate, but I learned about I learned so many wonderful stories and sayings in French. And then that's coupled with a Sicilian grandmother right out of the mountains of Sicily. And I learned stories about Sicilian dreams. So if, you, if some of you are saying to yourself, that guy is full of it, I can totally agree. I was filled up with stuff, and I'm studying history, and that's a great way to accumulate times and characters and people. It's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful, if, you, if you're willing to have a self that's just filled with all kinds of stuff, become an historian. That's a new ad for SSU. If you want to be full of it, take history at SSU. <laughs> All right, now, Buffalo Man is a book about when forts and trading posts mattered most. There was no state of Minnesota because it's in the 1850s. The land from the Native Americans in this end of the state had just been taken in 1852-1853. Taken, purchased, whatever you want. It's where the Upper and Lower Sioux came from. That, but if you go to the whole state, you discover it's a very recent invention. And it, it looks like a puzzle. So let me show a few slides and say one more thing. The world I'm interested in is Métis people in particular. They're half French, half Indian. 
Occasionally it can be a Scotch-Irish guy who gets into it, but it's usually the French who intermarried from the time they landed in Nova Scotia, they landed in Quebec, and it's a world of rivers, and who worked the rivers? The Indians, particularly the fur traders, and who else worked the rivers? These French people. This Minnesota, this territory, last point, is organized north to south. Forget California. Forget New York. This belongs to Quebec, the Great Lakes, the almighty Minnesota River, the descending Missouri River, the Mississippi that stole the Minnesota's claim. And then it goes all the way down to New Orleans and St. Louis, New Orleans. This world is a world that belongs to rivers. And if you ever get out a map here, you'll see the world I'm talking about. Let me show you some slides and then Buffalo Man will be born. So hold your breath, it won't be long. Two, three minutes and Buffalo Man will be, that's right, two, three minutes and Buffalo, what? Who's Buffalo Man is going to be born? Do we have to push? You have to pray. Do we have to push to to get him born? Oh no, we don't. You don't. No, no pushing to get him born. No, I'll tell you why in a bit. If I can figure this out, where's the arrow? I can do it if you want. Yeah, just show slides. This is start somewhere, Paula. That's a buffalo, just in case you forgot. <laughs> On a postcard, show another one. This gives you one example. This gives you one example of the divisions of property. But go to the next, it's much better. That gives you the territories that turned out to be treaties with the Native Americans. The thing I'd like you to observe is the large swaths and the recent dates. Now keep in mind I'm an historian. 1850 seems pretty close. My grandparents, my, the parents of my grandparents are born by, uh, already. Go again. That little cabin, you see it down the Minnesota River? Yeah. See it, the cabin? Yeah. I was getting tired of Southwest. We we're into one of our wrangles. So I got my canoe and started down the Minnesota River. My grandma, she's Acadian, French Acadian, and English, and God knows she's quite a mix like the rest of us. She said she had this giant uncle that once lived on the river, and he came home from the Chicago Fair in 1893, and pretty promptly died after that. And he was the giant of the river, she said. So I went looking for the cabin. Show another slide, please. And just below where the Harkin store is, but earlier, I found this cabin. It was stuffed with books. And the amazing thing about the books, where they had the journals of the giant, my great, great, great uncle, Bisson, on my grandmother's side, of course. Marvelous. Now, here's the kicker. Show another one just for heck. My friend Virgil, my friend Morris Gillette, who's now 94, but he did these drawings, the drawing for me when he was 92, called his art Shaky Art. <laughs> it's wonderful art. He did a lot of the logos in there. And just lately, this is not in the book. He took up painting. So this is Morris Gillette's shaky art drawer turned into shaky art water painter. That cabin was filled with stuff, but I read in one of the journals, it was written in very elegant English, climb the large cottonwood behind the cabin 
And in the big, biggest crutch you'll find wrapped in oilcloth, my last will and testament. Well, I was a little thinner, a little stronger, and cottonwoods aren't easy to shimmy. I won't tell you, but I did get up to the first crutch of the tree. And if you believe the cabin story, you're liable to believe I got up to the first crutch of the tree. <laughs> I did find the last will and testament, and thanks to having been trained by Kevin and my father-in-law on the law, I rushed over to Mankato, did a bunch of whirlwind tricky stuff, got possession of the cabin and all the books, came back with a U-Haul trailer, loaded all the books, and the canoe. I didn't want to forget my favorite 17-foot Grumman canoe along the river. I took that back with me. And since 1992, I've been writing this story of Buffalo Man out of those journals. So I think I've filled you up with a fair amount to start the story, and there's no need for pushing. <laughs> Show another slide, and God knows what will come up next. A fundamental theme, aside from how winds make our souls, when I came to Marshall, the most noticeable thing is the wind never stops blowing. Now they've added the windmills, those high reminders that things are going on. But as I've gotten to know the area, and I like the farming, I appreciate the settlement, but more and more my mind is settled. Water. If you look at the creeks and streams and gullies and washes of our area, Water are the veins and arteries of the earth body out here. And grasses that can be rooted in water, prairie grasses. Boy, that's a commercial for something, for water. <laughs> All right, let's have another slide. In eight... On June 21st, 1848. Do you know what happened on June 21st, 1848? You know what happened? I don't. Well, on June 21st in 1848 was the beginning of the second French Revolution called the Springtime of Revolutions there. They had them all over Italy, all over Northern Europe. Czechs had one. Germans had a couple. That was the great springtime. But that has nothing to do with the story. In 1848 also that Wisconsin, that cheese center became a state. Also we struck a deal with Mexico and got quite a bit of property off them in a war. But none of that has anything to do with the story. In 1848, just upriver from the cabin, Upriver, because the river's coming down towards Fort Snelling. Just upriver from the cabin, the whole river valley lit up. It was luminous. Luminous. No one could sleep. They were all out of their cabins. And out of the sky descended a big bubble. It was a buffalo, it was a birth sack, as best most could tell. If you've ever seen a buffalo born, maybe a cow, I've never seen a cow, but I have seen a bu buffalo born. Big birth sack came down. And just above the Little Rock trading post, which is right about where Fort Ridgely is, but it's an older one, headed by Joseph Laframboise, whose mother was native, and she ran the Mackinac Island trading post and taught school. She was off the top in terms of both economic and educational science, and educated all her children to know multiple languages. And just for, now this I just made up, but I think she sent them to Detroit to get an education because that's where I was brought up. And Detroit is a great name, a French name. It means the Straits, Detroit. 
not Detroit. Detroit. All right. Anyhow, this birth, this birth sack hit the ground, the little farm above the little rack trading post, with one god awful thud. Boom! Some of the more shabby cabins shook. There was a, all of a sudden a shout. I'm hungry. And born onto the pasture with 12 cows were Madeleine, the orphan who got, had to marry in effect, but did marry Joseph Bisson, both from Quebec, she from an orphanage, he from a farm of 20 people. How would you like to have 20 children on a piece of farmland that wasn't worth crap? you'd send them the way you send young muskrats out of their pond down river. So they could go up the river, up the St. Lawrence, down to St. Lawrence, work at the docks, or eventually they could, if the most adventurous ones, the space cadets of that period, they'd go to Manitoba and Saskatchewan and hunt buffalo fur. Because buffalo fur was the gold of the economy on the Red River and the Minnesota River. Because a buffalo fur could be worth... Janet, how many, how many buffalo, how many muskrat hides should I get for one good buffalo fur if I'm running a trading post? Well, at least 100 or more. Okay. <laughs> how about beaver? How many should I, beavers should I pay for a muskrat, a, a, a buffalo hide? 10, 15, 20? 20, 20. Uh, then you get the raccoon, finally you get to muskrat. Muskrat, though, are good eating. The natives love muskrat, they skewed them. Also, they did in down, in down River, Detroit River. For the longest time, we had a tra tradition of eating muskrat. And if it's snake, turtle, or muskrat, they all say it tastes like chicken to me. I've never heard anyone say anything other. It tastes like chicken. So he landed in this thing. I'm hungry. There was tremendous gurgling, burping. One fart. And all that was kind of exciting the first night. But when the gurgling, burping, and an occasional fart was shot up from the top of the ridge, and there was no sleeping. The people thought this is a problem, so they got the guard from Fort Snelling, about 10 soldiers dressed up in uniforms to go up the bank to see what was up there. And this is what's up here. He wasn't dressed like that at all. This is from Dorio, the great French 19th century artist. But the basic idea, he was nursing on the cows in his hands pick up one, feed off it, pick up another, and do that all day long. In fact, to quiet them, you put them in a boat, and you would tie four cows above them, and then he could feed on the cows all night long, and the current would settle them down. And they'd get them a little quieter at night. I hope you're believing all this and taking it in, because if, if you're not believing it, you're, you're not in the the full stream of this river here. <laughs> Anyhow, they were going to get a, a territorial peti petition to get him evicted and his adopted parents. They were childless and they were just delighted to have a son. Even if he were 17 feet 4 inches tall. He was born 17 feet four inches tall. So some of you guys who were tall when you were kids, you weren't nothing in comparison, or you aren't nothing in comparison to Buffalo Man. He was born, and you say, well, how the hell does he know he was 17 feet, four inches tall? Because it happened occasionally already in the 1850s, steamboats went up the Minnesota River, and some got as far as Redwood Falls. 
couldn't make it any further. And on one of the steamboats, there came an Italian historian who was interested in the history of anatomy. And when he heard about this giant that was beginning to trickle in the papers, the St. Paul paper, the St. Louis papers, he said, I got to see the kid. And he immediately saw that he was the same size as Michelangelo's David, 17 feet 4. That, therefore, have you all seen this picture like this? The famous art picture where you draw a circle around it, and the hands touch, the legs touch, and the head that forms a perfect circle? Everything about him was 17 feet 4. For your simple measurements, times everything about him by three. Except his brain may have went 10 times faster than the average child in his growth. He was speaking in full sentences, oh, within about two months. Very agile. Later, later, he learns to even tap dance and play a honer harmonica in the key of C and G at the same time. The C on the right hand side and the G on this. And honer harmonicas only came out in about that period. They're German made and got traded 1850s. They're kind of cheap by comparison. To, all right, well. He, the neighbors still wanted him evicted, is, but he started to get awfully friendly, and he was sort of contagious. He'd hang at the front of the porch. He started to learn several languages, so he knew two or three Indian languages. He obviously knew French, because that's what they spoke. But then again, he picked up a little English, and then later the people from New Ulm are going to start to settle right about 1853, 1854. So here kam Deutsch learning. He started to learn German. So he was a polyglot, if you want a nice word in case you're doing a crossword puzzle. A polyglot, somebody who knows a lot of languages. And he started to do favors for the neighbor. If they had a big glacial boulder, the kind like one of the three maiden stones down there at Pipestone that's at the entrance as you go into the park, he might roll it out of their field for him. In fact, later, most people don't know this, but it's in the book. On his own, without that same Italian teaching him a thing, he learned to play boche ball with gold, gl glacial boulders. And he was rolling these balls around and a lot of clanking. But he would help erect a barn. He could push it up. And he loved, which was very important in a river, snag removal. He loved to get on his knees and go down the river like this, as Bob and I have done once in a while, even tipped over once with Bob and his little kayak. And he would clear out the big maples and clear out the cottonwoods and just push away those beaver points that used to sink steamboats terribly. Sometimes a beaver snag would spear a steamboat. Did you know that? Run a steamboat right through and sink it? There's a big problem. Not as bad as your boiler blowing up, which turned into shrap metal and killed all the people on board the boat. That was bad stuff. A lot of book articles, newspaper articles. Usually a steamboat was only worth about 10 trips. And it was a problem. But anyhow, he started to help the neighbors. So everything was going pretty well. And the one thing he didn't learn to do, he didn't learn to walk right away. Anyone have a reason why he didn't learn to walk right away? 
Well, they were so dang good at creeping. Why walk when you can creep? Have you ever had a child that way in your family who slow to walk because he's a great creeper? Do you have any great creepers in your family? <laughs> well, anyhow, he was very obedient to his parents. But one day he was missing and he crept up. He went over to Henderson, not to Mankato, because it's a shortcut. You can cut that tip off the Minnesota River if you go roughly from Little Rock or say, uh, well, let's just say from New Ulm so you know the direction. You go straight across to Henderson. You cut, you save a lot of time. Well, he crept over there. Now, you might not believe it, but if you drive over in that area in the springtime when things are pretty wet, you'll see a lot of prairie potholes just about this size. Those are his knee prints from his creeping. The whole landscape is filled with these little potholes. Those aren't made by nature. They're made by the giant creeper. Well, he crept up to Fort Snelling in, in 1851. And what was going on in Fort Snelling was the first state fair, which is older than the state as is the University of Minnesota. State's 1858, but things like fairs and universities, they go on forever. So he crept up there, they're having the first fair, and everything's beautiful. The people are so happy after a final harvest, they're giving away stuff and talking and gossiping and talking about new people. And the fair is just a big gossip storytelling trade place, test out your food, show whatever you could make. And everything's great at the fair, except for a handful of Wisconsin braggarts. We've become a state and you're still a stupid territory. You don't have any cheese farms over here, I'm just teasing. You don't really have significant farms. You don't have a population that amounts to much. And anyhow, show another slide. Oh, what was this? Oh, this was the long trip that Joseph and Madeline took to finally find their place in the world. That's a separate chapter, show another slide. That was Madeline's honeymoon to get adopted, piano player, lace maker, highly educated. Then she had to leave the nunnery as an orphan and you either marry the man or hit the streets. So they dated for a couple hours in the thing and she got in his canoe and set out for Saskatchewan. You ever go on a honeymoon and have to learn to paddle a canoe? It's, it's start fires, it's tough. So show another, oh, here we go. So Gar creeps up to Fort Snelling. The map maker made one serious error. He took the shortcut from New Ulm. If I had a pointer, I do have a pointer. He took the shortcut from here to Henderson's, oh, there's Henderson there, so it cut that off. But then he went up to Fort Snelling, and these Wisconsin guys are brag, brag, brag. Anyhow, show another slide. Our four, not two, our four oxen can out pull anything you have in your territory. We already out pulled Illinois, Iowa. We could outpull anything you might conjure there. And they're given 50 to 1 odds. Only the women are restraining the men who are getting excited for those kind of odds, not to bet the farm. But they're betting everything else, cans of jelly and leather works. And, and the, some of the 
people right around Gar's place start to take up the bet. We think we have a creature that can outpull your four creatures. Well, the betting goes on all night, never gets better than 25 to 1, and the Wisconsin guys are completely delighted till the start of the pull. And the next day, after two hours in the morning, two hours of pulling across come two dead Wisconsin oxen. About a half hour later, two come across. They can still breathe, but for all purposes, they're meant for butchering. They're totally delighted with Gar. I mean, who wouldn't be delighted? They made all this money. But when you get too happy and proud, sin comes in or prides fall. What do you think their fall was? They said the Gar, that's his nickname, Gargantua, because this whole thing has a rooting in Rob Lay's book, Gargantua. They said to him, you can have anything you want to eat, Gar. We're so delighted that you won the pull. So how much did he eat? A lot. <laughs> more, what's more than a lot? If you were going to eat more than a lot at your grandma's house, what would be more than a lot? He was a glutton. No, he ate everything. <laughs> and if you go around Henderson, oh, we're going by, you don't need You can even see some spots with those potholes. There's a little tummy drag there, and it's like a little groove. He crept back to his place. Did he moan and groan? Started to keep everyone up. Made an occasional, I'm sorry, it's a, this is real high scatology. It's not pornography, there's a real difference between pornography and scatology. A lot of farting. <laughs> Even lifted the roof on a couple of the shakier cabins. Stood the shingle straight up. Worse, he produced a giant poop, or what was called in the book, the turd heard around the world. <laughs> it was about the size of a small submarine. <laughs> it was hard to keep people from coming up to see it. Steamboat loads of people were coming. And those newspaper people, boy, did they have a story now. They came all the way from St. Louis. And, and they even exaggerated the way the press does. You can never trust the press. <laughs> Eventually, Gar's parents and Gar's mentor, and I'm not telling this story, it's in the book, all the trouble they had baptizing Gar. Because the bishop, who does have an unfortunate name, what was the first bishop of St. Paul called? The first bishop of St. Paul was Cretan, <laughs> which is a very unfortunate name to have. Even in French, it's Cretan. And Cretan and Cretan mean the same thing. Somebody's a little short in a noggin. And he was learned in theology, though. And he said, as we learn from the Old Testament, I'll be interested in your remark, but giants are almost always evil. In the Old Testament, poor David had to slay Goliath. But now you're the Greek specialist tonight. Who is the worst? There's a lot of giants among the Greeks, but what's, who's the worst giant among the Greeks? Sismith the Cyclops. The Cyclops, yeah, the one-eyed monsters that poor Odysseus has to spend all his wit and intelligence and sneak his men out holding to the bottom of lambs, right, to get out of there. 
So the bishop wasn't altogether wrong, even though he's called Cretan. It didn't help he had an Italian advisor from Italy, a new priest, called Testadura. And Testadura in Italian means, in French it would be tête dure, hardhead. Testadura. And so they wouldn't baptize him, but a renegade ba a, a renegade Jesuit looking for a place to stay stays at the post. And in one blush, Gar is so intelligent, gives him, with a little training, first off makes him an altar boy because he insisted if he were going to stay, they'd build a chapel for him along the river. But within a short while, he has Gar, the giant, who's seven, make his, give, baptize him, make his first communion, and his confirmation at one stroke. Of course, he cites the Mass that day completely in Latin, but that's nothing because he's working on Greek already, and Greek's a little harder than Latin for us. Well, Gard does learn to walk. And his mother, before he, he got baptized, and his mother's so heartbroken, finally has a child after five, six years waiting for a child. Then it's God-given, and then the church. And she's an orphan of a nunnery. He, she can't baptize her child. But anyhow doing what the good wife does and resigns, she turns his baptismal gown, which is quite a, a feat, 17 feet. It's a big baptismal gown. She turns it into his walking cape so he can stroll across the countryside. He's walking. And she builds it with interior slots, slats. So when he tucks his head down, it becomes the smoke hole when he sets his teepee up. When he pulls the pole up, the slats go out like a good umbrella and form a full tent. And eventually everyone in the valley on bad nights comes into Gar's tent and he gets to trade and tell stories and make up languages. It's his learning of anthropology. As he walks, he takes up other kinds of almost spiritual stuff. Show a couple more slides and maybe I'll make fun. Yeah. He falls in love with all life. It's almost as if he's a, a blessed child. Falls in love with the butterflies, the fish, whatever those smaller things are, maybe snakes, the minnows, anything that moves, he considers a blessing from God in a special form of creation. So he has a spiritual side that's quite developed in, if you're a Greek philosopher, he's a Platonist. That's somebody who followed Plato. Show another he also gets interested in how life grows. He's only about six, seven, and he's interested in how light and water allow leaves, come into leaves, allow roots to grow, and then they sprout more leaves. He's very interested in cycles of life. I don't explain this with slides, but he also becomes, particularly in his commercial trip to Winona, he becomes a specialist in geology. He's particularly interested in the relationship of limestone to sandstone. Those two, one's a sea rock and the other's is a shallow rock. Where the sands are, the waters were shallow or running rivers, maybe a bay like pipestone. Where it gets deep, it's limestone and it's a sea rock. 
And so he gets very interested in how this works. He doesn't have anyone teaching him this. Even Senator's mentor doesn't know his naturalistic side. So show another slide and I'll make up something else. <laughs> We're starting a new chapter and it might be closing for you. I don't want to keep you all too long because 10 o'clock is too late. So I'll try to try and rush. No. Um, <laughs> Everything eventually is working out great in his life. He likes people. He likes the trading post. Later, he'll become a commercial agent himself and do commercial trading. So he has Joseph Laframboise as his trade mentor. He has Senator, a well-trained Jesuit, as his personal tutor. He has a father teaching good heart and stability, a mother teaching eternal love. He's totally educated. The world loves him. He loves the world. There's only one problem. Anyone guess what this problem is? Can't find a wife? Can't find a wife? No, <laughs> no, no that, this book doesn't even get up to the problem of giant sexuality. I, I, <laughs> I, I just didn't want to get into uh, pornography. <laughs> Scatology, a little, but not too much. A little just to uh, make it natural, because after all, we are creatures of the body. We are of flesh. We are of, and you can then fill it in and have fun if you want. But he has one trouble. As an only child, I understand this in particular. How does he get to play with other kids? When I was a kid, can Herbie come out and play? No, Herbie's busy playing the piano. And then Herbie looks out the side window and says, even if I weren't playing the piano, I wouldn't come out and play with you. <laughs> so you go in your bedroom and you know loneliness. And generally, if you're playing boche ball, that's pretty good. In the meantime, a Scot had come by and taught him early, early Lynx golf. So he, was, he, he set up a golf course, and his mom made handles, and they took plow bottoms and various things and made golfing <laughs> instruments. And he golfed roughly from New Ulm to Henderson again. Six miles, six holes up, the old traditional 12-hole course, not 18. That's a new invention. Six up and six back, like the Royal Troon, Presswick, 12 holes. But he's still pretty lonely. And when he'd say peekaboo to kids his age, it'd so scare him. I mean, he'd come up behind a tree and go, peekaboo. And, the kid might learn not to speak for a year. <laughs> Some would slobber and start to cry and there was no faucet to turn their crying off. So the school thought they'd have to work them into the curriculum or work them into the school somehow. They are good souls even back then that you gotta work everybody in. So they got a swing set. And they said, well, Gar, you can push the kids on the swing. Well, we start picking them up four farms away and you're getting them out of trees. <laughs> kids are terrified on the swing. These are some of the early stories I made up for my grandchildren. And when they put the merry-go-round and all the kids spun off the merry-go-round, and this was the Cape Canaveral, like New Ulm, of <laughs> kids in a twirl everywhere. And so Gar was starting to go to confession, and I, I'm not trying to make this too Catholic, but I must say this book is French and Catholic, and he's learning to confess. And he starts to confess what Centaur, his mentor, thought was a dangerous sin. And if his first thing was, I'm hungry, his second phrase was, I'm too big to be. 
I am too big to be. And that could, centaur's not dumb, that could lead to despair in an older person because it would mean God's creation or you in God's creation are an aberration, right? Then it means you didn't trust his grace, you didn't trust his providence, you're too big to be. So he was afraid of that. Well, that form of thought, fortunately, Senator didn't have to dwell on it long because one day, Gar is behind the post and he finds a 20-foot maple plank, three and a half inches thick, not a crack in it, and they go to the blacksmith and get handles put on the two ends, get a bar you put under it, and what do you think you have? Seesaw, or you call it seesaw? Teeter-totter. I call it teeter-totter, but it's same with creep and crawl. Different people creep and crawl. <laughs> so anyhow, he was delighted. He was joyous. He was going to be able to play teeter-totter with the school. <laughs> Meantime, of course, he runs 40 miles an hour and likes to bound to break snags. He's given up this kind of snag clearing and gone into bank bounding, breaking snags. Well, they set the teeter-totter up. On the far end, the teacher sits. And then starting with the heavier child to the lighter child toward the center of the fulcrum, this is a physics class, <laughs> you go to the fulcrum, and that of course goes down with all the teacher and 16 kids, it's down like this. And what's the other end open for? Gar to play teeter-totter. Gar is so jubilant, so ecstatic, he gives a full run, and one of his snag-breaking bounds and comes down on the other end of the teeter-totter. What do you think? Well, the teacher was uh, clinging to the chimney on top of the school <laughs> with a couple kids, but the bulk of the kids, the majority, say eight, they were like Christmas tree bulbs <laughs> on the tree down on the way towards the river. Unfortunately, three kids ended up in the river, but they were rescued by parents who'd come to see the first teeter-totter game. A couple teeter kids were catapulted across the Minnesota River. And if any of you know that area real well, they were catapulted halted over the bank of the Minnesota River down to, is it the little cottonwood or, that runs in just towards New Ulm? Although we've canoed it many times. And they were catapulted down on the canoe bank. They were so terrified, they were like raccoons, scrambled for any hole they could find. It took a week to get those burrowing ones out before they found them again. Gar was crestfallen, and we're getting near the end, I promise. Gar was crestfallen. I am too big to be. So Senator thought the only solution was, Gar, you got to meet a successful giant. If you don't see a successful giant, you're not going to learn how to grow up. You need a model. Well, he couldn't use, he wasn't around yet, Jolly Green Giant. And anyhow, he was a pea pecker, picker. He, he, he. <laughs> and Herman the German hadn't arrived yet. <laughs> and he was soon not well appreciated. So, Senator did the best he could. He sent him up to meet Paul Bunyan. <laughs> now, at this point, I want you all to guard your minds. I don't want you to tell this, this story north of St. Cloud. <laughs> You'll lose all your friends in Bemidji for sure when you hear this story. 
You think it's going to be a simple story. Our giant was bigger than their giant. But just listen to the end of what happens. Gar treks up there, this way, that way, goes up towards White Pine Country, which is where the St. Croix comes down then. And he locates Paul Bunyan's camp. It was wonderful. It was filled with storytelling lumberjacks, French, Finns, all kinds of Scandinavians. And the Irish always had stories of banshees and that. And it was just great storytelling. And Gar didn't drink yet. That's, that's good for them. Otherwise, he'd have drunk them out of the place with his capacity. But he loved all the commotion. And then, of course, the second day, he had to have a pull with Babe the Blue Ox. Now, that was no simple pull because Babe the Blue Ox did what? Well, thanks to Paul, they put a chain on the Minnesota River. <laughs> and Babe the Blue Ox, whatever you say, what do you tell you to tell an oxen to go? Yep. What? Get up? I don't know. <laughs> well, he, with that chain, he pulled the Minnesota River straight, took all the meanders out of it. So he was a tough pull. So they pulled for about four hours and finally, it was a draw. But it, it, the lumberjacks even loved that. Gave him more stories to tell. But he still didn't see Paul. And then one day, out of the shed, small shed came over the doorway, was written, Paul the boss, came this very short person. He was only four foot six tall. How tall are you? Five two? Uh, four foot eleven. So you were five inches taller than Paul Bunyan. But you're not as wide as Paul Bunyan because he was also four foot six wide. <laughs> now you have to understand how this happened to Paul Bunyan. His, originally, he's from French, uh, French, he's from Quebec, and he cut wood in the Laurentide Mountains, which are just above Quebec City. He was so good at cut, cutting wood that the French began to tell stories, and they can tell whoppers. They told so many stories about Paul, they weighed on him and started to compact him. So he couldn't stand getting shorter. And Buffalo Man himself, Gar, was getting slightly shorter. No one noticed because how do you notice a guy, go up to a guy 17 foot four and say, I think you've shrunk lately, you're three inches shorter. But he was getting shorter. The reason is his head was getting larger. When you think a lot, that's a danger. If you're a thinker, you could get short. That's why the best thinkers are usually little guys. So anyhow, Paul caught on to what was happening to him, all these stories going on. He said, I got to get out of here. But he's still the only thing he knew. Paul was fairly dumb. He could calculate board feet, though, in cash. He wasn't dumb that way. So I'm going to Maine and cut wood. He damn near cleared the forest of Maine. But then they tell stories up there, too, and more stories. He got shorter. Then he went to Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, and they have one of everybody and all kinds of storytellers. And worse, they started to have newspaper writers who tell stories. And a lot of the stories about Paul that, that made him small were written by newspaper writers' invention. So he was smaller. Where do you think he went next? After Mich you're following where lumber went? Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, that was kind of the coup de grace, the finishing blow. 
hammered him down. All that bragging about Paul Bunyan hammered him down. So by the time Gar got up there to meet Paul Bunyan, he was only four foot six. They got on great and had a great conversation, but I, didn't want, I don't want to tell you any more. That ends one little episode in the book called Too Big to Be. There's a lot of other episodes about the river rats who go up to the Red River and find a steamboat captain in a tree, find the whirling witches around another tree who tell your fortune. Then there's one politician in a tree up there on an island near Montevideo. And it seems that tree's always blowing to the left or right. You, it's like an upside down clock. Uh, what do you call that on a teeter, or, uh, uh, on a cuckoo clock? A pendulum. It's an upside down pendulum. It's a political talk. Almost caught, increases the wind up there. But there's a lot of stories that occur. But that's enough for now. I'll be glad to take only serious questions. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for listening, but I'll be glad to talk, uh, answer more. But that, that gives you an introduction. The book's available if you want it, 20 bucks. If you see some other book up there, look at the societies list. And uh, I don't have much more to say, but support our History Center and the Society for the Study of Local and Regional History. It helps bring you truth and greater truth. <laughs> and we promise, we guarantee with each one of our pamphlets, you will not be shorter after you read it. <laughs> but I don't say the same thing for uh, <laughs> Buffalo Man. Okay, thank you. I had a good time. I hope you did too. Well, the railroad? Well, you, you told the stories about the railroad. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, I had more fun with this. This was close to the Jerusalem Artichoke Circus for fun. Wow. And as artichokes cause flatulence, there is a little flatulence in Buffalo Man. There's some wonderful Indian stories about Jerusalem artichokes that are in Buffalo Man. Because they would get together and tell stories about what's the worst steamboat sinking you've ever seen. They had some old timers along upper Mississippi, just, south, just in Winona, describing steamboats and how they sunk, different size. Yeah. Days, they yeah. The, the well, land. the connection with the Red River right. and the Red River and Fort Snelling all the way to Quebec on the top end was far greater than the Mississippi. Now, I'm going to give you a story that is actually true. <laughs> <laughs> Geologically speaking, when the What's the big glacier, the lake Agassiz, is it? When that melted, some of the waters went north all the way to Hudson Bay. Another great portion came down the Minnesota River. Some, the valley actually of the Minnesota River is seven to nine times the size of the present valley that just contains the river. Now, here's the clincher, aside from all those uh, explorers who kept looking for the headwaters of the Mississippi and making a big deal out of it. The Minnesota that has its headwaters actually in South Dakota in a river called the Little Minnesota that's up above Flandreau. But when the glacier melted, coming down the Minnesota River and forming its giant river valley, you can see that again around Henderson. 
it was so strong, it drove the Minnesota River up, carved out the land, and formed, and this is truthful, formed St. Anthony Falls. So our river was strong enough to push the Mississippi back upstream 20 miles and gouge out its river valley to fit our river interests. So not only do we have a greater giant than they ever had up there in the north. So when you go by those statues of Babe the Blue Ox and Paul Bunyan, just remember Gar in southern Minnesota. Because I think there should be a restaurant down here called Buffalo Man's Eat. And a light could flash, I'm hungry. Y yes? How was Gar and what? How big did Gar get fully grown? For how big was Gar? Gar fully grown. When he oh, well, he got shorter as he went. Oh. When his mentor finally decides they're going to draft Gar in the Civil War and turn him into a cannon puller <laughs> or a tower, he's going to be killed in body. Or he sensed the Indian uprising was coming on the basis of the Spirit Lake Massacre in Iowa, which was a few years before our uprising, his mentor, Senator, again, our horseman, he got very concerned if they had this uprising, it would break Gar's heart in two because he was as much native, he was as native as a buffalo, he was as French as this, and he also liked the settlers. So he would end up on no side. So he shipped him out to Quebec City. He was 13. He sent him out there to get an education when he was 13. And you know what? He was under 10 feet when he got sent for education when he was 13. So from his birth, when he started at 17 feet, he'd gotten down to just above nine feet. So this is not a story of growing giants. <laughs> this is a story of shrinking giants. And you probably don't believe this, but I used to be a giant too. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. You have fun with this? It was meant to be, first off, fun.